Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the newest and latest edition of Fans Respected. I'm your host, Steve Hatch. Oh, well, you decided to include me this week. Oh, okay. What are what my co-host is referring to? Of course, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to want to watch our interview with uh, one half of Team Tremendous, indie superstar and former WWE development talent Bill Carr. If you haven't seen that yet. I strongly suggest it. Obviously, our co-host has seen it, and he's a little uh, peeved about... Uh, I take I take one-week vacation from this Mickey Mouse company, and all of a sudden, somebody can't find my flight plans to get back to New York to interview one of my very close friends, Bill Carr. Your close friend? Yeah, yeah. We, we're like this. Thicker than thieves. Thicker than thieves. He didn't mention you once, but... Uh, oh! He didn't oh. mention you, but he mentioned a lot of other talent, like uh, Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, so... Regardless, before we get into the episode, you should watch that episode. Yes, you should. You, you did wanna, a good job, by the way. Want to introduce? Thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm the actual host of this show, Mike Greco. How's everybody doing today? Actual host. Anyway, we got a special edition of Fans Perspective. That we do. This uh, it was actually suggested by a fan, and he's been a very loyal fan. And I'm going to give a shout out to him, uh, Tommy Boyle. Thank you for this suggestion about the cruiserweights. Is, is he a fan of yours? He's a fan of the show. Oh. He's a fan so, of, I, I mean, so he's a fan of mine, then. I mean, if he's a little crazy. But anyway, he suggested this topic. you got to admit, it's a good topic. We've talked a lot about, we really mentioned a lot about WWE, but this episode, obviously, it's going to be a big mix. Yes. Because the cruiserweights are really known for being all over the place. Um, getting into the intro, the style of the cruiserweights really came to prominence in Japan. Around like the, I think it was like the Tiger Mask era, Dynamite mm-hmm. Kid was maybe one of the number one guys that pioneered the style. Well, you could also look at the South. You had teams like the Rockers. You would consider the Midnight Express. Teams like that that were really, you know, they didn't have a title then, but they were cruiserweights. Owen Hart had the style. It was just, it was a different style at the time in the era where you had the Hulk Hogan's The Ultimate Warriors. Yeah. Um, so getting right into it, um, WCW kind of... Uh, Started with the light heavyweight championship, lightweight championship, I think it was called. Yep. It uh, was uh, Brian Pillman was actually the first light heavyweight champion. And it was only around for a couple of years. Uh, it only, I think, lasted for the years 91 and 92. And then it kind of disappeared and came back later to what would be known as the Cruiserweight Championship in 1996. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk a lot about the Cruiserweight Championship. But before that... The first American promotion that really brought in the luchadors, as they call, which yes. really pioneered the style of the cruiserweight wrestling, was ECW Extreme Championship Wrestling. Are you going to explain to our not so smart fans what the luchador where where they're from? Yes, I. In fact, if you were listening to me, you would have heard me say the Mexican luchadors. Oh, yeah, just because you say luchador doesn't mean they're from Mexico. I did say Mexican luchador, <sighs> but the ECW was the first time you saw guys like Psicosis, Rey Mysterio. They had a classic. A uh, match, a Mexican death match in ECW yes. that put these guys on the map. <laughs> they were doing flips off of cars. <laughs> no one, yeah, no one saw that back. This is the mid, early, mid 90s. Yes. And no one really saw that. They came from CMLL down in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was really a foreign concept. And it really set ECW apart. These guys started to get over. Yep. And then you started to see more of an influx. Like you had Dean Malenko, who he's not a luchador. No, but he had not by his, any far. And he's actually, the difference with Dean Malenko is he was a very technical style. Yes. But and also then Dean Malenko was there and they brought in Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit and, of course, Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, and the wars that Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko had in ECW. Well, you also look at the, the also with Chris Benoit and Sabu. Yes, Chris you know. Benoit. And Chris Jericho also got his start in America the Lionheart. in ECW. See, Chris Jericho actually came from that CMLL uh, in Mexico, mm-hmm. and he was called up to ECW. And even though like guys like Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero did have some high-flying stuff too, but not quite in the style of Rey Mysterio, mm-hmm. but the quick, it was just quick-paced yes. action. It's, it's a lot of what they would known as say is chain wrestling. You know, a lot of, you know, grappling, a lot of uh, technical aspects to the matches a lot of i wouldn't say it's arm drag arm Arm drag drag, yes sure yes arm drags and uh a lot of people started to take notice and one promotion that really took notice a lot of you know paul Heyman would kind of say stole was wcw eric bischoff saw the talent and saw money you know and whether 
people want to realize this or not, he was the smartest one to say, hey, I'm just going to get all these guys from everywhere. Because not only was he taking them ECW, he was smart enough to then join with uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and they did a, a whole, you know, d- WCW versus the world kind of scenario, and this was very early in the Eric Bischoff era, and bringing in all these guys. And the I believe the first cruiserweight, WCW cruiserweight champion was uh, from New Japan Pro Wrestling, correct? Yes, it was Shijiro Otani. And he won it on March 20th, two, uh, 1996, excuse me. But technically the first American WCW Cruiserweight Champion was Dean Malenko. See, that you bring, that's an interesting point because I always thought Dean Malenko was the first Cruiserweight Champion. That was the first that I remember mm-hmm. um, in that time watching WCW. When, when I first started watching WCW, it was for the NWO. Right. But then the Cruiserweights were really a nice change of pace, difference from Hogan and, and Nash and the Giant. Because it was better matches. It was it was better wrestling. And, you know, at the time in 96, you know, with, with our ages and everything, that's when we were starting, you know, the, the colorful characters were starting to fade away. Yeah. You know, so now we wanted to, and now, you know, like we've said in past episodes, we talked about, you know, better wrestlers. You know, we, we've we've enjoyed the Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart's. Now we're getting the, the Malenko's, the Jericho's, the... The Benoit's and these guys are having great matches all with each other. And speaking about colorful characters, the, the costumes, the masks, yes, everything really brought out. You oh, brought in Juventud Guerrero mm-hmm. was big. Uh, you had like uh, Cyclope, like, Cyclope, like guys like La Parca. <laughs> the How chairman you, of the board. Uh, I always was a huge fan. I mean, La Parca. Oh, technically, La Parca is not a cruiserweight, actually. Right. But uh, regardless, this is the this is you. They fans really got into the. I feel like the look, the style, the craziness. Um, it the Vianos. W- the Vianos, yes. Oh, the Vianos. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, and 26 of them. And then these guys really started to get, you know, they, they had these wars, and they started to get more and more popular and more and more over. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really, it's still, the WWE was still not picking up on it at the time, and WCW was, it was good to just see variety yes. on a program. And they were doing things that were just incredible between the springboards, the moonsaults, uh, I remember Dean Malenko hoisting Rey Mysterio onto his shoulders, throwing him up in off air the off top the top rope. rope, and catching him with a knee, a knee in the stomach, a gut buster. And it was it was incredible seeing this m- maneuver. And you say to yourself, "This this is great. This is what I want to watch right now." And WCW, not only did they just, but here's the thing: we keep talking about matches, matches, matches. WCW didn't just throw out matches. These cruiserweights had storylines. Oh yeah, like uh, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio was probably one of the biggest feuds. It it went on forever. Yes. Yes, but it, people didn't get tired of watching. No. And then you had uh, Chris Jericho. When Chris Jericho mm-hmm. turned heel. That was really when the storyline started coming together. Like yes. when he moved into Guerrero, when he took, you know, when he, he got the mask. The mask. Mm-hmm. And then I have to bring up the probably the biggest, biggest cruiserweight storyline of all time. Uh, it definitely got the biggest pop. And I think you know what I'm talking about Chris Jericho versus Dean Malenko. Well, uh, you, you, you look at that, and it's actually pretty funny. Uh, Jericho had beaten Malenko several times, Malenko took a little time off. That's when Jericho started the whole, you know, oh, I'm gonna, I'm the man of a thousand and four moves. He does the infamous, you know, reading of the list and they're just personality talking and talk. You know, it's it's funny. They go to commercial break, they come back, he's still reading the list. I believe it was Prince IK who comes out to try to break Prince it up. IK. Yeah, yes, you know, yes, you were right. And Jericho, you know, runs away, but he's still trying to get the list. And uh, it all culminated at Slambury uh, ninety eight, I believe it was. If my notes are correct, because I, I even have notes. It was Slambury 98. Press and they did a tournament, press. and the winner would instantly go into a match with Chris Jericho. That was a battle royal. It was a battle royal. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I apologize. Okay. Even I could be wrong once in a while. Don't ever correct me again on camera. Anyway, and <laughs> what basically happens is it comes down to uh, Sequel Pay and Hooventoot. And it's Sequel Pay wasn't even a big uh, top cruiserweight name. Right. See, but see, just just to break it up, that's how many names they had in WCW at the time that they were random. They were cruiserweight jobbers. Yeah. That's how many. They basically had a full 20-man battle royal of just cruiserweights, and you could name every one of them. You know, it wasn't just like random, you know, when they did like World War Three. you know, you didn't know half the guys. No, you could name every one of these guys. I still remember guys like Silver King. And stuff. Yeah, exactly. So what happens is... Uh, uh, Hoovy jumps out of the ring. And everyone's like, wow, he just gave up his chance at the title shot. And Malenko bends over and takes off the mask. And let me tell you, this was a Stone Cold type reaction from a crowd. It really was. If you haven't seen this, 
if you're maybe too young, mm -hmm. um, I highly suggest you know watching, finding this, going on WWE Network or wherever you mm -hmm. may find this clip and watch it, just because this was really this. Pete, Dean Malenko is is not known for his personality, no. but to generate that kind of pop, that's how, yeah, and it was a lot of the emotion. You know, Jericho had talked about his father and how much of a disappointment he was. It was it was it was a lot of emotion, but it was just a lot. And when when he starts lacing into Jericho, the place goes nuts. It, one of the loudest, I believe, WCW. Uh, crowd reactions I've ever seen. And to this day, people still talk one of the best things they loved about WCW was the Cruiserweight division. Yes. And uh, Rey Mysterio actually started to get title matches at this time. He, he fought Kevin Nash. But then yeah. around like around after 98, 99, you know, WCW, you know, kind of a little fall off. But before then, actually, before I get into that, I want to, WWE just wanted to get into the game. Yes. And uh, they created the Light Heavyweight Championship in 1997. Now, oh. see, I think this might have been the beginning of the end of the time. Uh, you know, Taka Mishinoku, who was a great wrestler, mm -hmm. was their first champion. Do you remember who he defeated? Uh, who, was it Brian Christopher? Brian Christopher. Yes, Brian Christopher. He was their, they were their top guys. Yes. I, I heard rumor. Now, I, this is a rumor. I heard that. Did you watch the Canadian Stampede pay-per-view? It was Taka Mishinoku versus, uh, I think it's the great Sasuke. Or whatever he's, I believe yes. that he yes. originally. I heard a story that, and this is trivia. He was originally going to be the one that was the cornerstone of the WWE Light Heavyweight Championship division. Really? Yes, but apparently he, I guess he in Japan he was telling he leaked it out, so they decided to just get rid of him. Well, I know another, uh, like you said, cornerstone of the light heavyweights was supposed to be uh, Ivan Putsky's son. Scott. They they had guys, but they just didn't have the personality of the WCW cruiserweights. What actually happened is in a match, I believe he goes over the top rope, does a sunset flip over the top rope, and when he lands, he blows out his knee. Oh yes, and they I had remember to that. Stop the match, and I I rarely remember seeing him after that ever again. Yeah, it, it just kind of there was like Scott guys like Scott Taylor, and they just kind of yep. like they didn't really have the personality, and they didn't. Another thing is, <laughs> even though they were good, huh. they didn't have the style. Gilberg. Well, we're gonna get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't really have the style, and yes, it kind of faded into the started. Mm -hmm. the, the WWE just kind of faded into. But the But they background. did have some good ones. Like Christian was a light heavyweight champion. Yeah, but he didn't really do much with that title. Right. Well, he didn't do much with any title, really. But you know, you you also have a guy like X Pac. X Pac was always a good talent, but at the time he never. Sure, he was in WCW. He was in W uh, Six Pac. Right, Six Pac. But, the only problem around this time, it would have been okay if the if they still had talent, but WCW then. They decided to. They were taking masks off all the cruiserweights. Yes. Uh, even Sikosis lost his mask, and it just wasn't the same. Yeah, they started watering it down. You know, uh, the biggest one was Rey Mysterio. I mean, you give him the victory of a lifetime. He beats Kevin Nash, and then a month later, he he loses to him and he loses the mask. And it didn't it, really it make changed sense. every. It changed him. He was never the same again in WCW. They could never find anything for him. It just it just didn't make sense. And then you had guys jumping to the WWE. Uh, Jericho losing Jericho yes. was a big loss for the cruiserweight division. Losing Dean Malenko, losing Eddie Guerrero, Guerrero Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit, yeah. I mean, even though these guys had kind of moved on to the yeah. heavyweight division, Chris, Chris Benoit when he got the WCW, kind of they they put one step ahead of these guys. They had yeah. him more time. What was the television title? But they still had Eddie Guerrero, Malenko, and you Ray. Going for the cruiserweight go, title, yeah. But I think I think once Jericho, I really you know really to bring the emphasis on Jericho, I think he was kind of like the backbone at the time, and then. Losing him, they just kind of like fell apart. And it just shows you, uh, he leaves WCW and his debut in WWE. He challenge not challenges, but basically goes toe to toe with The Rock. Exactly. It's that just shows you the difference. A lot of and a lot of guys at the time, like Eddie Guerrero, for instance, he they they the LWO was a shoot. I heard because yeah. they just they felt that they weren't giving the cruiserweights, even though the cruiserweights were getting oh, over. Yeah, they are right hey, there. They are. They weren't getting the attention. They weren't. They weren't getting what they deserved. Um, they weren't getting the money. They weren't getting anything. So that was really, I think, what led to the bad morale and what led to the decline. Now, WWF started to try at this time. Um, they tried to make S.A. Rios the late heavyweight yes. champion. I mean, S.A. Rios, I mean, what can you say about him? He brought Lita, so well, he was good, other than but that, he just got, I got nothing else. S.A. <laughs> Rios, he just they didn't have that Crash Holly. I mean, no, no offense to guys like Crash Holly. Uh, Scotty Juhani. They're good, right. you know, they're good talent. Yeah, but, but they weren't, the, it wasn't the same. It was, uh, I don't even want to say it was a watered down version. It was just different style matches. Th these guys weren't brought up on, you know, especially the Mexican and Japanese styles of wrestling. 
Yeah, they couldn't fit in with like the Ultimo Dragons. Right, exactly. But, uh, and they also, WCW had like Evan Courageous winning you know, the belt. The belt. N- not to cut you off, you mentioned Ultimo Dragon. There's a guy, when he first came into WCW, I think he had like nine titles. And he'd come out, he'd have all these championships, and he'd have Sonny Ono. It made you look at him like... Well, yeah, like that was the smart thing of WCW. Like, you promoted these guys that no one knew. But it was like, wow, just look at these nine titles. And I remember the hype behind him coming into WWE. Like, it was a big deal when he was coming in, and it was just like, you know, wow, okay, they're, they're finally going to do something. Now, at this time, they had brought in Rey Mysterio. They, they were going to, but... Uh, oh, they were bringing in... You know, WCW just really fell off. They had Oklahoma... The guy Oklahoma oh. was the champion, Medusa, won the Cruiserweight title. Yes. Disco Inferno. Daphne was also a uh, Cruiserweight champion. They, so, WCW clearly fell off its game, and this was a bad time for Cruiserweights. But uh, I hate to go to a break on a sour note. I have a little uh, oh, well, spin for our uh, fans five this week. Oh, well, you do, huh? Yeah. You, yeah. Did you clear it with the producers? I don't have to clear nothing. I'm the talent. Well, I'm going to allow it. but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of me and you always, you know, having to talk to each other. So I'm going to come up with my own fan five this week. Okay, okay. then. Well, uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to bring you the fans five. So uh, stay tuned. Hey everybody, this is Kevin Gennady, host of Hiking the Hudson, a monthly show about the history and hiking trails throughout the Hudson Valley. You can catch new and old episodes at Facebook slash Boneyard Pro. If you have any questions or suggestions for places I should go, follow me on Twitter at GuitarGod1984. Remember, Hiking the Hudson every month on Facebook slash Boneyard Pro. See you on the trail. I can't handle this editing anymore. This is completely frustrating. How much more work do I do? Good grief. <coughs> oh. oh, I didn't hear you come in. Hi, everyone. My name is John Harder. Wanting you to check out the Hard Wage Q Podcasting Network, courtesy of thejohnharder.com. Check out great podcasts such as The Hard Way, Nick and John Live in New Jersey, The Hardcore BF Podcast, and so much more. More. You can find us again at johnharder.com or on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Hard Wage Q. Be there. Yeah. I'm right. You're wrong. And that's pretty yeah. much yeah. That's the way it goes. Oh, we're back. <laughs> well, we are back, fans, and uh, this is the time of the show where we bring you the fans five. And uh, 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 besides. Uh, uh, uh. Besides for the twist, yes, I'm getting to that. We have a sponsor for the Fans 5. It's our friend uh, John Harder at the Hard Way Podcast. He will be sponsoring our Fans 5, and you can hear us on his podcast. We uh, actually, uh, you can hear me actually give a Fans 5 uh, regarding uh, Seinfeld. So it doesn't have to do with wrestling, but give us a listen on the Hard Way Podcast. And, uh, you, you, you cut me out of the Bill Carr interview. You did a Hard Way Podcast. You know, what's, <sighs> go ahead. Go ahead, Anyways, go this is the Fans 5, and my Fans 5 this week is going to be my five favorite Cruiser Week wrestlers. Number five, Psychosis. I always liked this guy's wrestling style. I liked his outfit. I loved his finisher was the guillotine leg drop. Yep. I remember as a kid, I used to always root for him to win the Cruiser Week championship. I just like his style. Number four, Dean Malenko. Uh, even though we mentioned before, I like guys with personality. He doesn't really have personality, but I always <laughs> know. But he, I like his style. I like the Iceman mm-hmm. gimmick. Number three, Rey Mysterio. I mean, Rey Mysterio, who, how can you not like Rey Mysterio? Number two, he lies and he cheats and he steals, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, Eddie Guerrero had, was a total package in wrestling. He had the look. He had the ability. He had the charisma. He had it all. And speaking of guys who had it all, my number one pick... My second favorite wrestler of all time, the Lionheart, Chris Jericho. I was always a Jericho fan, even when he was a heel. When I was a kid in like fifth, sixth grade, whenever he was the Grizzly champion, I talked about Chris Jericho nonstop. I was a huge Chris Jericho mark. I respect that. Uh, so I would have just had a little different. The only one I, I probably wouldn't have had psychosis on mine, I would have had Billy Kidman. Billy Kidman, he was a great competitor. Yes. Honorable mention to Billy Honorable Kidman. Honorable mention to Billy Kidman. I was a fan of Billy Kidman. Now, uh, you said you had a nice little twist on your yeah, A little five? twist. You know, you want to talk about the, the five best cruiserweights, or in any order, however you perceive them. It's Chris My Jericho, favorite. Your favorite, right? Which is perfectly fine. I'm not going to hashtag poo-poo on that or anything. 
But I'm going to talk I'm about my five favorite matches. Okay. Well, okay. That's, Which, I'll give you credit for that one. That's pretty good. Of course you will give you me credit. You can sometimes make a good It's the decisions. only credit. You should always give me credit. So, my fans five, I'm going to start off with a match we discussed before, which is Dean Malenko and Chris Jericho at that Slendery 98 pay-per-view. And, you know, like, we went over it before, basically, the whole build-up and Malenko winning the title. You know, it, it was, like you said, he, he didn't have much emotion. That was an emotional moment, and it was rare to see him like that. The next match I'm going to go with is, to me, probably the, the most technical cruiserweight match I've ever seen, Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero at Halloween Havoc oh, 97. Amazing. And it was just, it's incredible. It's as, as fluent as this could be, and they've probably have done this match a hundred times since, and I would probably watch it every time. Next up, I'm going to go with what actually was the main event of a SmackDown in 2003, and that was Matt Hardy versus Rey Mysterio. I remember that. And for months, Rey Mysterio was going for the Cruiserweight title. If you watch WrestleMania 19 that year, you could have swore he was going to win it. You know, that would, would have been his vindication, and he doesn't. And this all just leads up, and he wins a triple threat match against Shannon Moore. Uh, he winds up pinning, who was Matt Hardy's MFR, you know, oh, his number yeah, one follower. And he just, he winds up beating Matt Hardy, and it was, you know, for the Cruiserweight division, it was a big deal that that was main event in SmackDown. Now, um, next I'm going to go with Starcade 1998 and a match between Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, and Juventud Guerrero. Oh. And at times it got a little clustery, but the match itself was just great. The moves that were executed, uh, it, it was different. It's what you, it was like kind of what you wanted and more. Right, exactly. I mean, the end got a little clustery. Eddie Guerrero comes out. That was when the whole LWO thing is our awesome uh, technician had put up before the picture of them. That was just getting started. And finally, I'm gonna go a little off the off the grid here. Oh yeah. You know, I know we like talk about WWE a lot, even WCW. Yeah, that was where we grew up. But, uh, I'm gonna go with something that's a little different and talk about TNA's X Division. Oh, okay. And the match between Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, and Christopher Daniels at Unbreakable 2005, and it was the main event of that pay per view. And at a time where, again, you know, it's all about the bigger names. TNA had was just starting to get some notoriety. Jeff Jarrett was, you know, in the main event all the time. They put these three guys in a match for the X Division title, and it was incredible. It was flawless. It was as good as a match as they can have. And they had others after that, and they were good. They had the Ultimate X match, but nothing was like that first match. Is this the one? This is the one that was rated five stars. Yes, right? AJ Styles wins. Uh, Solo Joe's undefeated streak continues, and that's. My fan five for best cruiserweight matches. Well, um, I'm glad. I'm really glad you brought that up. I'm really glad you brought that up, Mike, because uh, we are going to take a nice little quick break. But uh, when we come back, we are going to talk about that X division. Oh, look at this. See what, see what I do? I give you gold. And we'll be right back, fans. What's up, what's up, everybody? I am Mr. Charisma Personified. I'm pretty much known worldwide, the Messiah of the Mat, the Master of the Mic. My name is Chris Caden. And well, you can catch up with Caden every Friday, only on YouTube. And even check out thejohnharder.com for the exclusive content, Catching Up With Caden. Remember, every Friday, you catch up with me and whatever shenanigans is going on, on the way to a pro wrestling event because I'm an indie wrestler. Woohoo! Keep catching up with me. YouTube or thejohnharder.com. Just don't make it look like I'm talking. Oh, yeah, that's I definitely can't, good I can't, idea. your face, yeah. just, we have to, keep. Yeah. oh, we're back. Oh, we're back, yes, and uh, we were, actually, we were just getting into discussion about uh, our next little segment here. No, 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 I'm going I'm to be truthful to my fans. I was just telling you that I hate your face. What fans? Oh, anyway, continue. Yes, uh, you know, my uh, host, co-host here, Mike oh, Greco, right. brought up the TNA X Division, and that was something I wanted to get into next. The, at the time... WCW was bought out by the WWE. WWE had merged the light heavyweight championship with the cruiserweight championship with X-Pac. Thank you. And uh, they weren't really doing much with it. However, a new promotion, TNA, came, I believe it was 2003 or 2004, debuted. 
Now, they tried something different called the X Division. Now, unlike the Cruiserweight Division, there was no weight limits. Right. Uh, but the style was in the same vein as mm-hmm. that Cruiserweight style. Well, when it first started before, I would say the first bigger wrestler that got into the uh, the X Division was Samoa Joe. And he's one of the biggest stars of the X Division. Exactly. But before him, you know, it was pretty much same the same build of guys. You know, AJ Styles, Chris Saban, Pete Chris Williams, Daniels. Christopher Daniels, uh, Loki. Uh, you know, Jerry Lynn was uh, one of the original yes, he was. Cruise, uh, X Division guys, you know, and they just, Amazing they, Red. Amazing Red, yes, yes. Uh, and they were bringing in guys from other promotions. And this is where really I think that TNA was hitting the mark because they were bringing in top wrestlers from, especially the time ROH. Yes. They were bringing in Austin Aries, Roderick Strong. You know, it's funny. I like the parallel between ROH and TNA, kind of like that ECW and WCW vibe. Where yes. TNA saw these guys, like you said, they were Austin Aries, uh, Roderick Strong, these mm-hmm. guys that were in TNA and they had a different style and mm-hmm. that, that WWE was neglecting. Yep, and they decided to bring well, it in. When our, when TNA brought in Samoa Joe, he was the ROH World Heavyweight Champion still. Oh yeah, they were still using guys. And he as, actually, I believe, he came out with the ROH World Title on really? an early Impact episode. Interesting. Yeah, they uh, you know they really used this niche that WWE was neglecting, and at the time, the fans that was really why fans were actually watching TNA. That's what fans were talking. Fans were talking about this at the mm-hmm. time. And you know, it was you didn't have big. It wasn't bigger guys, so you were seeing again. It was more like the start of the cruiserweights, where you were seeing moves that were just. Petey Williams doing a Canadian Destroyer, a lot of people like to say it's a stupid move. Let me tell you something. When he does it and it's done correctly, it's incredible. It does. Ca- it catches the attention. Yes. You know, Chris Saban had the cradle shock. AJ Styles does the Styles class. Oh, no, um, another guy that was also ROH, Jimmy Rave. That's you right. Know? Well, these guys became stars, though. AJ Styles became a star. AJ Styles is one of the biggest stars in the world right now. AJ Styles became a star. These Low-key was a star at the time. Yes. And uh, the Christopher Daniels, another one. Yeah, and he's been around forever, and he just he goes with it. And you also had guys like uh, Matt Bentley uh, in the early days. Uh, oh yes, yes, they had uh, Jay Lethal. Oh, was Jay there. Lethal, that's right, Jay Lethal. It, it was it was kind of like it just brought a lot of fans to the cruiserweight division. Out their mat, the match types were a little strange when they well, had like they had, but I think they were just trying to maximize the the potential like with the six-sided ring yes. like, to get more guys jumping off turnbuckles you had yeah. the the match where the x the ultimate x, the ultimate match, x match get the x from yeah. the uh, and there were so many great moves that they did off of that thing so many dangerous moves and you know you, you hear the whole thing all the time don't try this at home they did things that you really would I, not I mean, want to try let, let's face facts uh you know, wrestling, professional wrestling, and we've said it many, many times, it's not all about how many moves you can do or what you can do, but with that style, it's different. It, it's different with what, that style. What I liked about a lot of the, the TNA uh, X Division matches, it was the kind of the medium, because, you know, a, a lot of people argue the indies over the WWE, and the indie matches you'll see, you know, 500 fin- false finishes. You know, where in the WWE it's normally, you know, one or two, three the most, and the match is over, you know, finisher take it home. Yeah. The X Division was kind of the medium for that, you know. You'd see a couple of finishers, but it would just it, it would have a good ending, you know. And it, it really it built up the company. So, like I said, it main event in a pay per view. And, and unlike yeah, unlike WCW, uh, they gave them the main event credit. Uh, yes. They had these guys go. You know, AJ Styles became the TNA champion. Yeah. And it was just it, they gave them more credit than WCW mm-hmm. did. Now around that time as well. WWE had a brand split between Raw and SmackDown, mm-hmm. and they start. I feel like they started to take notice of the X Division because SmackDown started to incorporate the Cruiserweight Division. Then, what you're talking about, they signed Rey Mysterio. Mm-hmm. They signed Juventud Guerrero. They signed Super Crazy from ECW. Um, they they had they signed Psychosis. Psychosis being in there. They signed all the Kid Cash. Paul London. Paul London. These guys. Brian Kendrick. Brian Kendrick. Yes, these guys became the new Chavo Guerrero. Chavo Guerrero. Another yes. one. I have to mention it. But these yeah. guys became the new face of the cruiserweight division in the WWE. And for a while, I mean, it wasn't at the height that it was no. WWE. Not by far. But the cruiserweight title at the time, mid two thousands. Was important oh, on Hurricane, SmackDown. Shane Helms. Oh, yes. Jamie Noble. Jamie Noble, yes. ROH World who, Champion. R- Jamie Noble, who you still can see on Raw yes. every week, by the way. Yes. Um, but the WCW, you know, the influence of that Cruiserweight from WCW really came over to the WWE at the time. Mm-hmm. And I feel that if the X Division never really 
came to be. I don't know. WWE may have neglected it. I mean, it's not, you know, I can't say that they, for sure. You know, they saw, they saw something and they, they decided to, hey, let's give it a shot. Maybe it'll work with us. And it probably had a more successful run in the mid-2000s than it did in the late 90s. And don't forget, at this time, guys like Chris Jericho and Eddie Guerrero, who we were talking about, were main eventing in WWE. Yes. They weren't looked at as these small guys anymore. They right. were looked at as top-tier talent. And I think a lot of that not only has to do with that their influence in WCW, but fans kind of more shifting. Well, and they that. also they started giving guys a shot. Like with Kendrick and London, they they won the SmackDown Tag Team Champion Championship, and they I believe they're still the longest reigning tag team champions in SmackDown history. I believe so. You know, and and they were facing bigger tag teams. It's just you know they they went with it. They gave it a shot. It, it worked out for them. Gregory Helm, uh, Shane Helms, uh, the Hurricane, who went then with Gregory Helms. Same thing. You know, he was the longest cruiserweight champion in SmackDown history as well. Yep, that's right. You know. Now uh, we're going to go into a fan question of the week. That's right. Every week now we are going to have a fan question. So fans go on to you know go on to uh, Twitter. You can tweet me at Heavenly Hatch or our Instagram or Boneyard Productions on Instagram, and of course our Facebook. And you can submit a question. Now uh, the fan question of the week comes from a Wally Bernard from New Haven, uh, Connecticut. Wally, you know Wally. We hang out with Wally all the time. Go ahead, continue. Maybe you do. But anyway, Wally writes, who do you guys feel is the most successful cruiserweight? I'm going to have to probably say, I'm going to go with Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero. I will go with Eddie Guerrero. Uh, you know, he started, like we said, in ECW, went through the WCW ranks, went into WWE, had a big injury when he first came, probably pushed him back a little bit. But he worked his way up to the WWE Championship, beat Brock Lesnar, the Beast Incarnate, okay? Beat Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 20. You know what the best thing about when he beat Brock Lesnar, the fans didn't didn't think it was stupid? No. They embraced it. It made perfect, yeah, it made perfect sense at the time, too. You know, we got a little help from Goldberg, but that's fine. But, you know, he went on to face Kurt Angle, and he always stayed relevant. He always found a way to keep himself in some kind of storyline that he always said, oh, I wonder where Eddie Guerrero is doing this week. He did always entertain. How about yourself? My pick, I'm gonna. Uh, well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you who I think, and then I want to bring someone else up who deserves credit. I'm gonna bring up Chris Jericho. He is my pick. I feel he is definitely the most successful cruiserweight wrestler of all time. He's been multiple time world champion. Mm -hmm. He's still relevant in wrestling today. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer when he's ready to go in. He's still you know competing here and there. Uh, I just feel Chris Jericho, but I'm gonna give a nice little shout out to Rey Mysterio. And that's simply because Rey Mysterio, now you can say what you want about his world championship reign, but the bottom line remains this guy is five foot four, and he became the WWE, not only the world heavyweight champion, he became the WWE champion as well. And still, he is also still relevant to this day. I mean, right. injuries kind of derailed his career there, but I'm going to give Rey Mysterio credit uh, to him. Maybe it's a subject for another day or a future episode or something. I don't know. I think we will. I don't really. I'm not a fan of either one of his title reigns, whether it's World Championship. Regardless, or he still WWE. won. Regardless, he still yeah, won. Yeah, but he won because Eddie died, and they basically had nothing to do. That's they didn't want to do Cena versus Miz on Raw, so we'll do Cena versus Ray. That's a good point. And Cena Punk is still the world what? champion. That, that's a good point, but you know what? I want to bring up how the merchandise sales for Ray. I want to bring up how over he was at the because time. Because little kids love him. Well, that's you know that's relevant. That's relevant in the business. Now, I want to segue in now to the main event scene in the role of cruiserweights nowadays because obviously the cruiserweight title was unceremoniously retired in 2007 uh the last champion was a uh, hornswoggle oh, so obviously at the end it kind of faded it kind of faded out but there's a reason why i think that happened now the reason why i think that happened is because a lot of these cruiserweight guys are now not really thought of as they have to be in their own division they're kind of thought of as main event talents um on par with these you know guys like john cena and, uh, right. you know, Randy Orton, bigger guys. Well, I mean, you, you know, to mention that, uh, of course, you're talking about a guy like Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan, I, yeah, you perfect know. example. But, you know, back maybe 15, 20 years ago, a guy like Seth Rollins, who's the WWE champ, World Heavyweight Champion right now, would probably be considered a cruiserweight. Especially with his style, I think he definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you got guys down in NXT who are main eventing, like uh, Finn Balor. Yes. Uh, uh, Tyler Breeze. Tyler Breeze. Uh, even someone who's on the roster right now, uh, Adrian Neville. Yes, he was the NXT champion, and this guy is 
if he came out, if he debuted in 1998, 1997, he clearly would have been a cruiserweight. Yes. But fans nowadays, he was in the Money in the Bank match. Fans yeah. nowadays treat the cruiserweights like big stars. So and, I feel that there's not really a need for a And you have all the guys that, that they tried to, actually, that, that got over on their own. Like a guy like Evan Bourne, uh, Evan Matt Seidel, as he's known now in the Indies. You know, he, he was very, he was huge. You know, probably if it wasn't for a leg inj- injury, who knows? They may have given him some kind of shot at a major title at some time. And TNA even, they had Austin Aries was the champion. Chris yes. Saban was the champion. Chris Saban was well. So yeah. I, feel, I feel the reason why the – because a lot of fans are like, bring back the Cruiserweight title, bring back the Cruiserweight title. Me personally, I would it would be nice, but I don't think it's necessary because these guys are main eventers now. They're not looked at as they need to be pigeonholed. The problem with the Cruiserweight title – and I don't know if you notice about me. I'm a guy that doesn't like labels. You know, I feel like labels are just – you know, you, ha- you put a label on something, it has to be that way. It's different from the U.S. and the Intercontinental title because those are just, you know, those are a title that's working you up to the big time. Yeah. When you think of a guy as a cruiserweight champion, it's kind of like, all right, you're a cruiserweight, you're little, you know, and that's th- that guy then is never going to be looked at the same again. You know, it's crazy. I have to agree with you. Oh. Can you believe that? I actually agree with what he says. Well, that's because I'm always right. That's a fact. Always. Well, I think we can go to the tape and prove that that's not always the case. <sighs> well, uh... I guess, I guess I'm done looking at your face for this week. Yeah, I guess we are. But uh, you actually brought up another topic, speaking of Rey Mysterio, because our next show is all going to be about guys who have never been the world champion and guys who were the world champion, but maybe should you know, not have been. Maybe, maybe should not. But that's going to be an interesting topic. But uh, before we go, why don't you uh, put over yourself? Because I know that's oh, the only God. reason why you're here. <laughs> well. <laughs> Ah, all right. So we have at Real Mike Greco on Twitter. We have Secret Agent eighty four on Instagram. Michael A. Greco on Facebook. Hashtag poo poo. Hashtag all hell. Hashtag bad guy you. Hashtag uh, slap a patch if we have to. Uh, hashtag Buko's gonna get beat. You know, and uh, pretty even, much even hashtag else. PR guy. Even hashtag PR not. guy. That's right. Where the hell is that guy this week? And no wonder we didn't have stats on the side because of him. But, I had uh, nothing coming in front of me. You crazy. know, it's not hard to find a, you know a guy that's just going to sit there and do nothing like he does. But he could be replaced well, like that. But anyway, I'm going to let the fans know. You can uh, tweet. You know, if you want to be a fans' question of the week, or if you want to suggest a topic like uh, Tommy Boyle did here, or if you want to submit your own fan five, go right ahead. You yeah. can uh, you can tweet me at Heavenly Hatch, or you can get me on Instagram at Heavenly Hatch. And of course, we have our Instagram Boneyard Productions. And our Facebook, Boneyard Productions, where you can go to our YouTube link and you can watch all of our episodes, including that interview with Bill Carr that uh, Mike Greco was not a part of. So yeah. it's probably going to be very high yeah. view just simply why. because of All that. you do is put over the company. Ooh. Forgive me Are we for done? being a company. Are we done? But uh, anyways, fans, i like to thank you for watching this edition of Fans Perspective. And uh, you have a good night. Good night, everybody.